Radio is sponsored by Truefire. Over 2 million guitar players worldwide improve their playing using Truefire's online lesson system. Learn, practice, and play with Truefire. Hi, this is Keith Williams. Welcome to 5 Watt World, where Rich did help you get the most music from the least gear. A few years ago, I heard on public radio that the average American reads 0.5 books a year. This has always stuck in my head, though now, thankfully, I can't seem to find the source of that ominous statistic. What I could find was an article citing the Pew Research Center on reading from 2015. According to that study, if you average together all the books read in the U.S., it comes out to like four books per person per year. And this sort of cheered me up. Of course, these stats are inflated by the most voracious readers. Americans read less than other parts in the world, with India leading and Thailand and China close behind. Americans read about half as much as the average person in India. Even growing up on the farm, I was always a bookish kid, so coming out of college where they had told me what to read for four years, I'd already started building a reading wish list. My first job out of school was as an admissions counselor, and it helped in this cause. I read applications, interviewed students, ran the tour guide program, and traveled to high schools a lot. I mean, I traveled a lot. My travel territory was New England, so every time I left my job at Elmira College or later at Ithaca College, I'd be looking at a six to seven hour drive. So I'd borrow books on tape from the local library, and though I had very little money, I'd often find myself out on the road without a book to listen to. I'd spend money I didn't have at a bookstore on an emergency book on tape to get me home. A typical day on the road was high school visits from 8 in the morning to 3 in the afternoon, when the high schools closed. Often in the evening, I'd work at a table at a college fair. This left me from 3 in the afternoon to 7 in the evening free every day. And in that time, I'd either find somewhere to go for a hike, or more often, I'd find somewhere to read, usually restaurants and bakeries. You know how people say pre-internet? Well, this was pre-Starbucks. Used paperbacks sustained me. And since I had as little space in my tiny apartment as I had money in my pocket, I had a strict rule that I couldn't own more than three books I hadn't read. Unknowingly, I was already starting to wrestle with what's enough. In that first fall term, I read 33 books in three months. I remember this clearly not because it's a record or anything, but because at the time, it seemed like quite a bit of reading. I'd settle into alternating between fiction and nonfiction books. I was hoping this would help me learn about how to be in the world interspersed with how authors imagined characters learned about how to be in the world. After admissions, I had jobs where I had a commute of over an hour each day. So I subscribed to a service that would send me recorded books each month, and I plowed through them. Books I never likely would have been able to sit through in an armchair, but because I was already doing something else, driving myself to work, I seemed to weather just fine. All of Charles Dickens, Moby Dick, Jane Austen, basically everything they told us in school we should have read. But what I'm recounting was many, many years ago. My reading took quite a dip in my 40s and 50s, and like making time to listen to music, it's just now coming back around. Still, my wife Anne reads much more than I do, and often she gives me the best recommendations. Making the short history videos, I spend days poring over reference books on gear, but growing my YouTube channel has presented some new challenges, and it sent me off looking for new answers. So these are the five books that this one-time prolific reader enjoyed the most this year. I'm not sure that they provided new answers as much as a new language for questions. Better ways of describing that sense of things in my gut. What's better than that? If you enjoy our videos, take a minute to subscribe and hit the bell icon to be notified when we put out new videos. And if you've already subscribed, swing by the store and grab a t-shirt or a hat to support what we're doing here. And if you don't need another hoodie, but want to become a bigger part of 5 Watt World, think about becoming a friend of 5 Watt. The links are in the description. And in response to requests, I've added a tip jar as well. Now on to my five favorite books for the modern musician, 2020. Yuval Noah Harari's Sapiens. Recommended highly by many sources, I think I learned about this from Bill Gates' annual book recommendations. Sapiens was a worldwide bestseller. Harari is a historian, a college professor, writer, and speaker. You can find dozens of interviews with him talking about the book, but I assure you it's a great read and well worth your time. Harari recounts the growth of human civilization as it progressed through our shared stories. Other people might find another point from the book sticks out more for them, but for me, it was this. Our societies are built around shared stories, fictions that we all buy into. An example Harari uses is money. We long ago moved away from our currency having any innate value. No gold coins, but rather paper money. It has value because we all have decided to use it to keep track of exchanged value. It is the power of the shared story, something we all believe together that gives it value. 
So it isn't money that's powerful. It's that we share a story of money that's powerful. Often people ask me how I choose the topics for my videos, particularly the short histories, and my answer is always the same. It's a great story. Whether it's the Klon Centaur or the Fender Telecaster, there's a great story behind that piece of gear. For a guy like me who loves great stories already, Sapiens helped explain why stories have so much power and why we are wired to look for and resonate with great stories. The fabric of our very society literally depends on our shared love of a great story. Getting Things Done by David Allen Let me first say I am not, emphasize not, interested in books about productivity. I have never had a problem having what one of my first bosses called a sense of urgency. What I am always looking for is a way to do a lot and be able to sleep well at night. To not have my mind racing with cool ideas that I won't or even shouldn't remember to pursue in the morning. Released way back in 2001, Alan has gone on to have an entire consulting career based on how to best to deal with all the to-dos that come across your mind in the course of a day. The idea is to capture the things that need to be done and to keep from having to think of those same things over and over again. The basic method is in these three simple steps. One, you write down what needs to be done. Two, under that, you write the desired outcome. And three, under the outcome, you write the first step to reaching the desired outcome. Once these three things are done, you've got the idea captured, and the act of capturing it should keep it from needing to pop into your mind as a pressing to do again. But more importantly, you've tricked your brain into thinking about the thing just enough to have started doing it. When you come back to the listed item, you have a sense of where to start, even if you've decided that that place to start is by throwing out the earlier idea and starting in a different way. You still didn't have to think of it over and over again. The punchline here is that by getting these things out of our heads, we are clearer to be present to do what's right in front of us. Things like finding time to practice guitar, listen to some new music, or get a good night's sleep. Why We Sleep by Matt Walker which of course is the perfect segue to Matt Walker's book on sleep and why it is likely the most underappreciated activity in our lives. Again, this book came from one of Bill Gates' annual book lists. I figure Bill has some serious staff and friends recommending books to him, so it saves me time to use all those people to my own advantage. Why We Sleep is a compilation of the history of research into what happens in our minds and bodies, notice the erroneous distinction, while we sleep. If you've ever been the least bit curious about how your head works, the book answers many of the questions about how sleep, getting enough and not getting enough, affects our ability to do pretty much everything. Not surprisingly, I read and reread the section in the book about what happens when we take time to sleep on it, a phrase Walker tells us exists in every culture on the globe. In particular, how sleeping on it positively affects how we process practicing our instruments. In layman's terms, certain types of sleep have been found to be crucial to filing away our experiences, to processing them so that they can be of use in the future. Walker recounts meeting a concert pianist that said he long ago settled into practicing before going to sleep, and that he found that when he did that, he could literally play things in the morning that had impo been impossible for him to play the evening before. His brain had continued to process the practice and had found a way of playing the difficult passage. The next morning, clear-headed, he could often play the passage without trouble. Research shows that even a nap where the subject was able to get some light sleep helps give the brain some time to shuffle the memories into an order that makes sense upon awakening. Using a simple computing metaphor, our brains use sleep to shift memories from RAM, from operating cache, to an area of our brains dedicated to remembering how to do things that involve muscle memory. Walker reminds us that we don't really have memories housed in our muscles, but rather we have memories in our brains associated with using those muscles and neurons in certain ways. I may be a story nerd, but I've always also been a data nerd. So I went right out and bought a Fitbit to start tracking my sleep patterns. I figured the better I understood what helped me sleep well, the better I'd feel, and now I'd learned I'd also improve more quickly as a musician. I used the Fitbit for a couple of months, but was frustrated by a tendency of it to report my sleep inaccurately if I woke up in the middle of the night for an extended period. I decided that overall the Fitbit was more geared towards tracking exercise, and I went looking for a better sleep tracker. So I upgraded to an Aura Ring. Besides dealing with the data dropouts of the Fitbit, the ring was less cumbersome to wear to bed and it seemed to report my sleep patterns more accurately, particularly deep sleep, which is harder and harder to get as we get older. 
I've taken all this information and changed when I practice, moving it from the morning when I feel the most fresh and always assumed that I'd be the most creative, to before grabbing an afternoon nap, or to the hour immediately before going to sleep. The latter, of course, helps get me off screens sooner before bed, another good idea for getting some good deep sleep. You'd have to read the book to get all the other tricks. Make Time by Jake Knapp and John Zaransky. Like getting things done, make time is more about having a balanced life while getting lots of things done than it is about increasing the number of things you can pack into a day. In fact, make time is really about trying to minimize the number of things that other people try to squeeze onto your to-do list and maximize the satisfaction you get from choosing which one thing that will be the purpose of each day. They call that one thing the daily highlight, and it can be anything from right sections of the musician's YouTube or workshop course to get in an hour's walk, or cook dinner for friends. By choosing the highlight of your day, you're taking control of both what you decide is most important today and you create the expectation of looking forward to doing that thing in advance. Of course, this seems so simple, and yet anyone that's wrestled with setting priorities in the past with limited success will know how tough it is to pull it off. So the authors share more than 80 different strategies that they have tried to help choose your highlights, have the focus to require doing them, and have the energy to get it done when the time comes. Like most people, I have a huge list of things I want to get done. <laughs> and after reading Get Things Done, that list is bigger than ever because now I've tried to capture them as I think of them and get them out of my head. But like getting things done, make time is focused on successful strategies for finding the time and clear-headedness needed to wade in and finish them all feeling better and less rushed while doing it. I often joke that I'd rather be a guitarist that makes videos than a YouTuber that sometimes gets to play guitar. Make Time was a book that helped show me new ways to make sure I stay a guitarist with a smaller helping of YouTuber on the side. Steal Like an Artist and Show Your Work by Austin Kleon. Yeah, okay, you got me. I said five books and here I am slipping two in under the heading of number five. In my defense, I will only say that each of these books is small, each is easily read in about an hour, and each worth rereading immediately upon completion. Steal Like an Artist and Show Your Work were national bestsellers, really like all the books on this list. And though the cynical among you might sneer at the populist measure like sales, it certainly means that the message reached many people and resonated for them. These are two small books written by and for a creative person. As Cleon quips, someone like you. Cleon's first big book, Steal Like an Artist, outlines all the ways that everything has already been done and said. He includes a quote from the French novelist André Gide that is now stuck in my head. Everything has been said before, but since nobody listens, we have to keep going back and beginning all over again. This is a clever way of saying that the great truth should be revisited to have meaning in the present day. I think Cleon is reminding us that each of us won't tell this story the same way. I often have said that it would be interesting for my YouTuber friends, Rick Beato, Rhett Schull, and myself to all make a video with exactly the same title. I'm confident that the three videos would all be very different, and yet I'm equally confident that if we'd chosen the topic well, we'd all come up with something worth saying. Or such is my hope, at least. <laughs> Carrying on this idea, Show Your Work, is really Cleon further musing about why in this present day, it's important for an artist, writer, musician, and God help us, a YouTuber, to be putting his or her work out there. It's never been easier and more possible to share ideas directly with the world and to find the people with whom those ideas resonate. Those people can then work with us to support creating more art, as opposed to content, along the same lines. Ultimately, Show Your Work encourages each of us to share our unique story and see how many people share that particular version. As Yuval Harari might say, how many people embrace that shared fiction? And hence, how many people are really in our own tribe, even though we have yet to meet them? I've partnered with Truefire because I've used them for over a decade, and my playing always improves when I put in the time on their lessons. Whether you're a beginner, intermediate, or professional level player, Truefire has lessons to inspire and advance your playing. As you know, I always promote spending money on lessons before new gear. I really like Truefire, and I think if you give them a shot, you'll like them too. Get 25% off courses using the promo code 5 watt 25 Or like I have for many years, sign up for the All Access Pass to use the entire Truefire catalog. You can sample anything in the catalog with the All Access Pass and see where the Muse takes you. I love their tagline, Learn, Practice, and Play with Truefire. I'd like to thank Truefire for partnering with me and sponsoring this video. 
Every book on this list related to my life as both a musician and as someone making videos for YouTube. So if you're in either category, I highly recommend that you check them out. I don't really give books as gifts. That's always seemed terribly presumptuous to me. But I do regularly give book recommendations, and this video is me doing that. I'm probably not at the book a week level that we hear so much about on YouTube. But like my goal of listening to more new music in the coming year, I'm sure that reading is a clear way to collect new ideas. And wrestling with other people's ideas is a sure way to come up with new ideas of your own. Along those lines, I need to thank all of you that have written in in comments or in emails and recommended books to me. I really enjoy the hive mind that's developed in the 5 Y world. I need to thank Jeff McElane for his permission to use his tune Double Espresso in the intro and outro of the video. I always think of coffee when I think of books. There's a link to Jeff's channel in the description. I need to thank all of you that have stopped by the store to buy a t-shirt, hoodie, or the Stomp preset pack. And in particular, I need to thank the friends of 5 Watt for their continued support of everything we do here at 5 Watt World. If you enjoyed the video, hit the like button. And if you haven't subscribed yet, go ahead and hit that too. Thanks for watching. Until next time, thanks for being a part of the 5 Watt World.